when you're talking about like just world news have been crazy. Like the Paris attack was just a week ago, right? Um, there's what there was Beirut right around then. There was uh, uh, what else was there? There was that that Russian plane um, in Egypt. Um, those allegedly all three of those ISIS has claimed um, credit for. We don't know whether it's true or not, but ISIS has claimed credit for those three. Um, we have unrest in America with uh, African American students. A lot in Missouri. <laughs> with our Missouri representative right here. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of crazy things going on right now. I think Mali, there was just a, there's a bunch of people that got killed in Mali just yesterday, I think. Um, and uh, I think Kenya was not too long ago either. So right now in terms of, of what is going on in the world, there is a lot of, of just unexplainable things. Um, some of it is explainable. If, if it is truly IS, then it is organized, honestly. Some of it is from a direct cause. Some of it isn't. But we are living in a fairly turbulent time. And I think this is something that for many of us, it's harder to see. Um, but as we get into the text and as we see the many things that are happening, honestly, this is a very detailed chapter. I don't know if you guys have read this in advance, but this chapter gets into very strict details about what's going to happen. Okay, um, and, and that was a very turbulent time in history, and honestly, nothing has changed. We are living in just as turbulent a time right now. So with that, with all the difficult things, all the struggles that are going on, I want you to keep that in the, in the back of your mind as we look in the text at what was going on then. Okay, so turn with me to Daniel 11. Open up your Bibles, smartphones, or look at the screen above. We're going to start in Daniel 11, starting from verse 1. Where the Lord says this. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Um, that might sound a little weird because that's actually should have been part of the previous chapter. Um, but that was basically the man in linen talking about what he was doing. Anyway, so now the man in linen is about to speak. So he says in verse 2, Now then I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule with his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain his power, and he, uh, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort, and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them over or carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the kings of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a, a great army which will sweep on like an irresistible flood, 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 and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army, larger than the first, and after several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and, and build up siege ramps and, and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be uh, powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine uh, to, to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. 
and he will turn his attention to the coastlands. And we'll take many of them, but a, a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. Successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when his people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully and with only a few people he will rise in power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefather, uh, forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. Then the king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand uh, because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provision will try to destroy him. His army will be swept uh, will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will, stir, will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlines will oppose him, and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who are, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword, or be burned, or captured, or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or the one desired by women, uh, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortress uh, with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at, at a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in a battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cal uh, cavalry and a great fleet of sheep. Sheeps. Sheeps. <laughs> <laughs> he, he will invade the great fleet of sheep. Um, he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries uh, will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. And he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Amen. Woo. Long passage. Um, lots of kings, lots of sheep, <laughs> all sorts of things going on. Um, just to, to kind of catch you up where we've been this year, we've been going through this theme of the new life. We started with 1 Corinthians. We went through the story of Joseph, and now we're in the story of Daniel. And, you know, we, we saw through his life that, that God was showing us what it means to live in a society that does not follow God, in, the, in a society that is trying to push you away to other things. 
And we saw from Daniel's life the things that he did, the things that his friends did that, that showed us how to live in that type of circumstance. And then from the, the second half of Daniel, it was a bunch of crazy visions. All these visions that Daniel kept having, these dreams. And we're, giving, we're being given different challenges, right? And the last challenge that we heard, um, like uh, yeah, two weeks ago, the, the challenge was this man of linen shows up, right? And he closes out the last three chapters, so chapter 10, 11, and 12. This man of linen shows up and is described in such an amazing way and is never once does Daniel try to identify him. And I gave the argument that I truly believe that this man in linen is actually Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ before he came to earth as a baby, right? And so in my opinion, Jesus shows up. And Jesus wrecks him. He can't talk. He's powerless. And three times, Jesus touches him and gives him strength and gives him power. And in that regards, Daniel was crying out. He was fasting. He was praying and interceding on the behalf of his people. God heard his prayers and sent Jesus to speak to him. And so this week, now that we know that God listens to our prayers and that God responds... And sometimes in amazing ways. Now we're going to hear about what he's being told. Okay? So as we've gone through this book, the main thing that pops up in every single chapter is that no matter what, God reigns. And the scale has continually escalated with each chapter. It started first with just, you know, what he was eating, right? The Daniel fast. He, he, he asked to eat only vegetables, right? It started with something as simple as that, and it has expanded for, from kingdoms to now the whole world and now to the future, right? What is being revealed to Daniel is hundreds of years before him. Probably about four to five hundred years of history is being, is being disclosed before him. And God is showing, I am the God, not just nations, but the God of all time, of the future. And so now this man of linen, linen, linen <laughs> is sharing the vision that he came to, to share with so, interestingly enough, the last chapter, it, it talked more about um, these different princes, the, the prince of Persia, and, and these different things. And you could sense that those were not actual people, but it was spiritual forces. And so, what was first a spiritual discussion in chapter 10 has now shifted in chapter 11 to a very physical world, like actual people, right? And we're going to get into some of those details. I don't want to bore you too much, um, but we will get into some of those details. And so with this chapter, this uh, of all the chapters in Daniel is the most detailed prophecy. It's not just general themes. It's actually getting into like specific people, specific events that actually did happen. Okay? So first off, right from the beginning, it's like it talks about four kings. It talks about, you know, there's three more Persian kings coming, and the, and the fourth one <coughs> is gonna he's gonna be really rich and he's gonna gain a lot of attention. Um, and the Bible actually only identifies four Persian kings. There's Cyrus, who created the empire. There's Xerxes. You guys know Xerxes? <coughs> well, what's, what's important about Xerxes? You guys know what book of the Bible he's kind of most important in? It's a very popular female name. Esther. Yeah, good job. So, so is there, under Xerxes, what was the problem in Xerxes? What was going to happen to the, to the Jews until Esther stepped up? Yeah, they were going to get wiped out. There was this, this, this guy that really didn't like them, and he actually tricked um, Xerxes into creating an edict that would actually wipe out the entire Jewish race until Esther stepped up and, and challenged it, right? And so Xerxes, and then Darius, um, who, who we know is kind of known as the one who brought freedom to the Jews. It actually happened with Cyrus, but Darius was the one who went back and said, oh, Cyrus already did this. Okay, you guys are free. <laughs> um, but he's giving kind of credit for that, and, and Artaxerxes, I actually don't know too much about him, but he's the last Persian king named in the Bible, right? But in actuality, there are more than four. There are actually nine, technically, if you go to the history books, until the end of the Persian Empire. And so because of that, it's kind of difficult for us to know who exactly this fourth king is. Is it Artaxerxes, who isn't the last king? The last king is actually another Darius forget what number. He's another Darius. Okay? Um, so again, we don't really know. And, and, and in this instance, as I've been sharing about in the past, 
prophecy in the Bible usually is not too exact. It's kind of an approximation. And because of that, I've always kind of said, when you look at prophecy in the Bible, it's more important to know what is the heart of this telling us. Not so much about the actual details. Now, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, interestingly, from this point on, it gets very specific. Here, it starts off very generally, and is actually maybe a little bit off, but then when it gets into the next part, I can match up everything to actual people, right? This one, I'm not entirely sure. Doesn't matter. Um, and I'll explain to that. I'll explain that to you why. So remember, when we're looking at prophecy in the Bible, it's less about the specific details, but more about what is God trying to tell us in this prophecy. And so, Alexander the Great, right? It talks about this kingdom of, of this king in Greece, this mighty king with great power, who creates an empire. And obviously, this is very obviously clear that this is Alexander the Great that is talking about. For those of you that don't know who Alexander the Great is, you know, this, this, this guy who came to power at a very young age, he was 20, and by the age of 30 had created the biggest universe of his time. Universe, empire of his time. So for those of you, those of you guys that are 30, what have you done with your life? <laughs> but sadly, he dies, like two or three years later, age 32, 33, depending on who you ask. He dies and he has no one to give his empire to. So what ends up happening is his entire empire is split into four by his generals, right? That's the story of Alexander the Great. And the interesting thing is, is as important, like Alexander the Great is considered probably the greatest, one of the greatest military minds ever. Like one of the greatest strat strategists ever. That's why he was able to create an empire so quickly. He was brilliant. Oh, okay. But the interesting thing is, as important as he is in all of history, all of you have learned about him when you've studied history, the Bible here only takes about two or three verses. It doesn't really care about him. He's probably the most important person in this whole thing that I'm talking about, but the Bible doesn't care. It's like, yeah, yeah, this guy, he kind of makes an empire, and yeah, it gets split up. That's it. So why is that? Why is this passage getting so detailed about certain things, but something that you would expect it to talk more about says almost nothing. We'll get to that in a second. So, now most of this text is talking about the king of the north and the king of the south. Right? Now you have to understand what that context is of north and south in this text. North is not like Europe. And the south is it's kind of in Africa, but it's not like, you know, it's basically when you look at this, um, Remember, the kingdom was split up into four. Um, but the two prominent kingdoms that matter were the Seleucid kingdom up in the north and the, uh, the Ptolemaic kingdom on the, on the south. Okay? The Ptolemaic kingdom was mostly um, in Egypt. Mostly in Egypt. The Seleucid kingdom would be kind of in like the, the Syria, Syria type range. And so basically, the reason why this is important is because right here, right where they're kind of intersecting, that's where Israel was. Okay. So this is important because the king in the north and the king in the south, they are fighting again and again and again. Who is caught in the middle? It's Jerusalem, Judea. Right? So because everything that happens, because these kingdoms are constantly fighting against each other, it's constant trouble and turmoil for the Jews. That's why... This text gets into so much detail about what's going on between these two because it actually mattered in the lives of the Jews. Alexander the Great, eh, didn't matter, right? What he did, sure, it was great from a histor historical point of view, but it actually didn't affect the daily lives of the Jews. Here, every little thing that happened mattered, okay? And so now the text gets very detailed into exactly what's going to happen over these next couple hundred of years, right? So in each verse, you can actually pick out specific people. I don't want to get into too much detail. You got honestly, this isn't too important for you guys either. But I want you to see that in every single verse, every single character that's listed, you can actually link to an actual historical figure. In verse five, it talks about the Ptolemy II and Ptolemy III. Right? It talks about a strong king and how how the next king would be even stronger. A uh, daughter of a king. Baroness, in, in, in verse 6, she marries Antiochus, the, the Seleucid king. Um, but then, like, 
she married him to try to unite the kingdoms. But then he decided, ah, it's not worth it. He went back to his previous wife and had her killed. Okay, so that didn't work out. And so her brother, Ptolemy III, he goes back and, and defeats Seleucus, the successor to, to Antiochus. And so basically you have this, this fighting. They're trying to get peace by like sending, you know, a daughter or something like that and, and to marry and to build some type of relationship, but it never works out. And so there's fighting that's going on. Verse 9, you, you see that it, it matches up with this, the verses of, of the king from, from the north tries to go in the south, but he doesn't do anything. But then his son is successful, Antiochus III, right? And so Antiochus III actually goes down, he conquers the Ptolemaic kingdom. Um, but then there's this fighting going back and forth. I don't want to get too much into these details. Now with verse 14, you actually see that it starts talking about Jewish people. And it says that many will rise from your own people. Many violent people will rise. And the, there are actually, there is a movement, and it's actually in certain texts, the Maccabees text. Maccabees is not considered part of the Bible, but it's considered a historical text that talks about what happened in Jerusalem during this time. And there were people of the Jewish race that wanted to fight against Ptolemy. Ptolemy came and he tried to go to the Jewish temple to give a sacrifice. He said, no, you can't come here. And so he started killing Jews, they got mad. Um, and so they started to revolt against Ptolemy. Okay, Ptolemy IV. Um, so again, you have all these different things going around. Apparently, I didn't know the first Cleopatra was part of this. Um, this is obviously not the famous Cleopatra. Because <laughs> she married what? Um, yeah, yeah, like Mark Anthony, right? Um, so, this is a different Cleopatra. This is the first Cleopatra. <laughs> but she's part of this. Um, they try to marry her off. That doesn't work out. Actually, what happened there, it's kind of funny. Um, they married, uh, he, he married Cleopatra to Ptolemy IV. And he was expecting her to help him gain power. But then she sided with her husband. It didn't work out. <laughs> but anyway, so continuing on, like, you see Rome starts getting involved and fights back against Antiochus III. Um, you see Antiochus III, he passes away, like he dies, like looting a, a temple in Persia. And then his son, he inherits his dad's mess. His dad has spent so much money fighting against Rome that his son feels like, okay, I gotta raise taxes. So he starts raising taxes and gets killed by his prime minister. Um, and so then you go through the rest of the passage from verse 21 to the end, and it's all about one particular king. And it's Antiochus IV. You guys should remember him. Because when I was talking from, from chapter 8, chapter 8 was actually another vision about this time period. Remember when you look at chapter 7, it talked about four kingdoms, or the four beasts. And then in chapter 8, it only talks about two beasts, because it's talking about um, the Persian kingdom as well as the Greek kingdom. Right? Honestly, chapter 8 and chapter 11 line up perfectly in terms of the time periods that they're talking about. Antiochus, as I mentioned back then, this guy was, in history, probably one of the, the people that the Jewish, Jewish race hates the most. Right? I said, number one, people would probably say Hitler. Number two, they would say Antiochus IV. The reason why was he, he conquered them, right? He, as a Seleucid king, he conquered them. He starts taxing them. He starts taxing them to death, they say. And then he starts messing with their religion. And the text talks about it too. It talks about how he ends the daily sacrifice, he desecrates the temple, the abomination that causes desolation. What people believe the abomination that causes desolation is, he went into the temple and sacrificed a pig. Now if you know Jews, they don't like pigs. And they definitely don't want you to sacrifice a pig in their temple. Okay, So that's considered the abomination that causes desolation. And then he put up a statue of Zeus in the Jewish temple and said, you worship Zeus, not God. And so out of all the kings, he's the one that interfered the most with the religion of the Jewish people. And so he persecuted them. And he tried to convert them. He tried to basically Hellenize them. He wanted them to become more Greek. And so the passage talks about that, that, that for those that he, with flattery he will try to corrupt. So he actually turned many Jews to become more Greek, and to give up what their beliefs were. So having said all this, 
Daniel is being shown the, the many struggles that are going to come for the next couple of hundreds of years. But as I showed, the, the passage is very selective over what it gets in detail on versus what it doesn't. You would expect it to talk more about someone like Alexander the Great, but it talks much more about this guy Antiochus IV, who in all honesty, he was important, but he wasn't as important as some of these others. But in terms of his impact on Jewish life, he definitely interfered the most. Okay? Now, there is a camp of people that will look at this, this book in the Bible and they will say, you know what? This isn't prophecy. They will say, you know what? This was written after it happened. They're like, you know, you don't know when the book of Daniel was written. So basically someone, um, during the time of Antiochus IV, started writing this book and he named it Daniel. And um, in this book he started to write about prophecies, but these are things that had already actually happened. And so you know, he just wrote it, he's like, hey, I wrote this book. It was written by this guy Daniel hundreds of years ago. <laughs> Read it. And, and so there's, there's many that would believe that this actually isn't prophecy at all. That this is basically a retelling of what has already happened. And there are many who read the Bible this way. Um, and, and the thing is, and I know some of you, especially you Yonsei students, have been taught some of these things, like what the document theory. You guys know what the document theory is? JD, JDEP? Um, basically, it, it believes that there are four different um, groups of people that wrote the Bible, and they kept editing the Bible. So basically, the version of the Bible that we're getting has been edited four times, and that different authors have written different parts. And so they're, when they look at the Bible, they're like, okay, this was written by J, this was written by um, E, this was written by D. Um, and, and so some of you have studied classes that do things like this, and it sounds really smart. Like when you're like, yeah, man, yeah, that Bible, it's been edited. That's not first edition, man. <laughs> Someone came and, and they say redacted. They redacted the Bible, man. It's like, yeah, like someone hundreds of years later added that stuff to them. And so it sounds really intelligent. And, and there'll, there'll be things like, yeah, you know, the, the parting of the Red Sea, you know, where the, where the water disappears and stuff like that, that didn't really happen. Uh, you know, the Red Sea, um, it was actually mistranslated. It should be Reed Sea. And the Reed Sea, actually, the water just comes up to here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Didn't know that. They just like, so basically, they, they, they find ways to, to interpret the Bible in a way that it actually doesn't have miracles. And basically, God doesn't really do anything, honestly. And this has been a dominant movement within probably the past hundred years or so, within scholasticism. And so there are many people that would read this, this chapter and say, oh, somebody wrote about what has already happened. That's not prophecy. And that's kind of the era that we're living in today, where, where I, like, what I really feel is going on is the Bible is being treated as if it's guilty until it's proven innocent. So the, the, the thing I don't like about these particular scholastic movements, it sounds really smart, but the basic assumption is the Bible is wrong. So they're like, okay, we're going to find out how the Bible is wrong. That's, that's the assumption that all of this liberal theology movement is, is starts with. It says, okay, number one, the Bible in its form today is not correct. So we're going to go back and figure out what the original Bible is. That's the basic concept. And that's, that's what, there's a lot of people out there today that this is how they understand the Bible. Basically, they're taking, okay, this part was added later, so I don't need to read this. Okay, this part, I think this is original. So, okay, this is real. So basically, they have taken the Bible and sectioned off what they like and what they don't. Famous person did that, Thomas Jefferson. Right? Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America, there's a, what they call the Thomas Jefferson Bible. Basically, he looked at the Bible and he picked out the parts that he liked and he cut the rest out. <laughs> so he like made his own version of the Bible. It's probably really short. <laughs> and interestingly enough, if you study hist history, one of the first, um, the first cults, right? the first person labeled as a cult, uh, Marcion, 
he did the same thing. Basically, he took the different books of the Bible that were circulating back then, and he's like, you know what? I don't like Paul. So he cut out all of the Paul, right? And he's like, okay, this is okay. And he basically made his own Bible, and he's considered probably the first cult in, in history. But this is kind of the age that we live in today where the Bible is being challenged. And the Bible, the number one assumption is that it's wrong. And let me just tell you something very clearly. If you cannot accept the Bible for face value, if the Bible itself cannot be your standard of truth, then what is? That's the one thing that we have that we can say in common, this is truth. If you take that away, and you're like, okay, this is good, this is good, ah, I don't like this too much, then basically you can make your own beliefs. There is no standard. So brothers and sisters, the Bible has to be our standard. So I, I like to read the Bible for what it says and to start from there. That, that's how I like to function. Now, one of the funny things, I was serving at this Methodist church, and apparently Methodist seminaries are very liberal. Okay, I don't know how many of you come from a Methodist background, but your pastors are taught some very shady stuff. And so I was talking to one of these Methodist pastors, and he's like, yeah... I'm so confused every Sunday. I'm like, why? He's like, at school they teach me that the Bible is wrong. And then I have to preach and I have to tell my church that the Bible is right. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I'm like, okay, man. <laughs> you have fun with that. <laughs> and so that's the thing is when, the, when you take away the Bible, what do you have? Honestly. So with that said, obviously I support this as prophecy. And the reason why I can say that very firmly is because the book of Daniel is quoted by Jesus. Jesus treats Daniel as if it is scripture. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He got that from the book of Daniel. Jesus even talks about the many things, even in this passage. So if the man that we see as the Son of God accepts this as scripture, then it's good for me. <laughs> I don't need anything more than that. Okay? So, all that's it. Um, really, when you go through this text, it, it, it just it, there's a pattern that's going on. It goes through a king, and this king rises. It keeps using the, the verb arise. This man arises. And then, and then the, the, they fall down, right? There's a cycle of, of up and down, up and down, up and down. And basically, there's, this, there's three verbs that keep coming up again. First is arise. And then it says that, oh... This man is so powerful that no one can stand against them, right? And then it seems like this, this person is going to completely change everything, and then they fall, right? You have this cycle again and again and again throughout this whole text. And so what God is telling us is, he's the one who still reigns. These people that keep coming up, they arise, no one can stand against, but then they fall. They're not the ones in control. If you remember in, in, in the visions in, in chapter 7 and 8, the different beasts, it was always in the passive voice. It was always saying authority was given to them, power was given to them, it was not their own. In that same way, God is showing as His kings keep rising and falling, rising and falling, all their plans never coming to fruition. He's the one who is allowing them to do what they do. But what it always says is, but at the time, the end will come. Every single character that I talked about in this very detailed text, in the end, they still fell. Even Alexander the Great, just a couple years, that's all he had, then he fell. So brothers and sisters, what really comes forth is, when he gets into the part where you see Antiochus is challenging the, the religion of, of, of the Jews. He gets into these verses 32 to 34 where he says, With flattery he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. As I said before, Antiochus was trying to change the Jewish people to become more like Greeks. 
Verse 33, those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. The end still comes. But what is coming out through verses 32 to 35 is there's a challenge for you to stand for. Like, you know what, this man is going to come. He is going to completely desecrate the temple. He's going to completely challenge your beliefs and encourage you to let them go. And he's saying, but resist him. And I think I'm actually comforted even more by verse 35. Some of you will still stumble. But that's so you can be refined, purified, and made spotless. So, like, that, that, that comforts me because then, you know, okay... It's not completely up to me. Even if I fail, you know what? It's, it, it'll actually be for my better. Right? Otherwise, if it just stopped at verse 34, I'm like, man, that's a burden. <laughs> I gotta do this all on my own. I say, like, no, even when you stumble, it will be for your betterment. That's what it's saying in the verse 35. And so we're living in a society now. Granted, we don't have this kingdom in the north and this kingdom in the south that's warring here in Korea. Well, kind of, sort of. <laughs> but we're living in an age more so where it's actually about beliefs. You know, some of us were actually discussing this the other day, um, yesterday actually, um, that, that really when, when it comes to what is dictating what is going on right now in modern times, it has nothing to do with, it has very little to do with politics has much more to do with what you believe in. But we're living in an age where you are being told, especially in America, that, you know what, don't push your beliefs on other people. That's not cool. Right? Keep your beliefs to yourself. That, that's what Western society, that's what this generation is teaching us. You can have beliefs, but you know what, but don't, don't share with everybody else. Like, don't ruin the party. But what actually is being shown to us is this is what matters most. What you believe and how that dictates how you live your life, that's what matters most. All the conflict that's going on in the world right now, all these crazy bombings and stuff, that is because they believe in something. And for us, our answer shouldn't be to withdraw and say, okay, you know, that's cool. They have their own beliefs. You know, I don't want to impose mine on them. They're imposing them on you, okay? Whether, whether you want, whether you know it or not, right? The fact that you are terrified of the things that are going on, that is being <coughs> imposed on you because of their beliefs. So brothers and sisters, we are living in an age where your beliefs matters the absolute most. So what you believe and how that actually dictates the way you live your life, that's what matters most. That's the age we live in. So, as this passage says, Daniel is given hundreds of years of conflict that are about to come. And as I've shared in the past, if you are a believer, conflict is coming. You are not going to have a picture-perfect life. If you truly believe in faith, your beliefs will cause you some type of suffering at some point in your life, probably often. But the challenge is, do you stand firm? Do you resist? Or do you compromise? So, just to stay with the as if he reigns theme, the challenge today is, resist as if he reigns. When the world is telling you, you know what, compromise. You know, get with the times. Like, you know, people talk about, you know, like, I don't want to get too much into this, but, you know, stuff with, like, same-sex marriage. You know what, that, that's, that's our times. Well, what, what's wrong with you guys? Why don't you guys update yourselves? That's one of the arguments I hear about people when they look at the Bible. Like, you know what, the Bible's outdated. Like, I think we need to update the Bible. And, you know, this, this, this stuff about... Um, you know, gays and lesbians, that, that, 
we, we, we can edit that out, right? That's a common thought in our age today. And what I've been trying to tell you guys is, that is our only standard of truth. We cannot give that up. So brothers and sisters, in all the craziness that's going on, stand firm in your faith. Know what you believe, and let that dictate how you live your lives, and don't give it. For those of you that have been going with us in Revelation, and again and again, the message is, do not compromise. In 1 Corinthians, when we went through in the beginning of the year, do not compromise. And here again, as we're going through all these things, all these different kings, all this turmoil, the same message is, do not compromise. Resist as if you are. Let's take some time to pray. I'm going to go ahead and close it up. Um, so, I just want you guys to take a moment to to just dwell in the, the place of, God, are, are there areas in my life that that I am compromising? You know, are, there, are there things that I'm kind of giving in? So, just take a moment to, to search your heart and allow God to show you. There are many reasons for us to 